Hi everyone. So this week we are going to be looking at the segregation era 1910 um, to 1948. So let's see, begin with an introduction on historical consciousness, okay? So historical consciousness takes many forms. So man has always had some sense of history. As long before the first word were put on paper, past events um, were remembered and information about such events was passed down um, to the next generation. So we will be concerned with the way historians have viewed the South African past, right? So historians have differed throughout history. So historians wrote in the 1920s, 1930s, 1950s, 1960s, differed um, in their strengths and in their limitations. So to understand the relevant social issues in South Africa, um, to work towards transformation, we should not view history as just mere records, chronicles of past events, but should, should involve the study of the origins of contemporary social problems. Um, so history should not be a mere matter of records, as I said, of past events, chronicles. So it needs to involve the um, original study of contemporary social problems, okay? So we must take a contemporary problem and investigate its historical roots. So we need to draw lessons from the past for the present. So we need to ask ourselves how and why a racist South African society um, had become into being. So as we go through this lecture, you need to keep in mind the importance of the economy in historical development. So I want you to look at race as not just um, a psychological factor and see that the emphasis of race issue um, are by their nature economic, okay? So I want you guys to be able to explore the relationship of race and class as historians. Um, so do you guys know how you're going to be able to do this? Okay, you will need to read the readings I will give to you. If you read your lecture material, you will become better at writing and arguing or debating social issues. So here is a solid idea of how you could get through your readings, okay? Um, you guys could, um, in order to become critical thinkers, you guys could read with each other um, as classmates um, in small groups and hold discussions after doing specific readings. Um, if it is possible, or you guys would be surprised um, at the shared insights and perspectives that can come out of reading together and discussing ideas. Um, if you can also, it can also help just clarify sections and work through difficult um, concepts and enhance, just enhance your critical thinking skills. Um, so you guys need to do your readings and summarize them this is a very good exercise. Do a reading and just summarize it in your own words. Um, you will become better in history by just reading every day. Okay. So now that part of the introduction is done. So let's look at South African politics, 1910 to 1939. So in 1907, a significant development took place in South Africa when the British and the Boer reached an agreement to establish a unified government. This was on the agreement that Africans will be kept out. So this laid the foundation of what would be later known as the Union of South Africa. 
the union constitution that was drafted because of this agreement um, limited power and representation to the white population marginalizing the black majority. So this officially came into being in 1910, this union. The interests here were centered around um, the white population in South Africa. So during these years, um, 1910 to 1939, the successive South African administrations were all centered to consolidate white power in the new state. So the political landscape was dominated by white minor minority rule, particularly by Afrikaner dominated national party and the English speaking. So the Afrikaners in the rural areas were frustrated with the British government. And this led to an uprising by aggrieved Afrikaners during World War I. Militant strikes by white workers, one of which, which escalated into um, a bloody confrontation um, on the Witwatersrand. So black South Africans occasionally resisted as well. But these groups um, felt that their interests were not being adequately represented, right? So when whites talked about the racial question, they were referring to the Breton versus the Boer, okay? So which was the ethnic cleavage between Afrikaners and English speaking white South Africans. <laughs> Excuse me. So they engaged in internal conflict centered around symbols, poster stamps, postage stamps, anthems and flags. So when it came to disputes regarding native policy, their disagreements revolved around finding the most efficient methods to promote their individual and material interests <clears throat> and ensure their security. <clears throat> so the South African led, um, the South African party led by Louis Buta and Jan Smuts won the general elections of 1910. <clears throat> Buta and Smuts were former Republican guerrillas who had gained control of the Transvaal, Transvaal in 1907. Buta, a progressive farmer with vast land holdings, and Smuts, <clears throat> an able and um, ambitious Cambridge educated intellectual had reached the conclusion that it was a sound policy to come to terms um, with the gold mining industry industry as the most powerful economic enterprises. So they believed that forming a coalition with both ethnic factions of the white South African population was the wise thing to do. They embraced South Africa's membership in the British Empire, but advocated for greater autonomy for South Africa and other white um, domi dominions, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So though parliament enacted laws in the interests of white workers and farmers by 1919, when Porter died and Smuts succeeded him, the South African National Party was losing Afrikaner votes and becoming dependent on the support and becoming dependent on the support of British South Africans. <clears throat> <clears throat> so here is something interesting. The British stood no chance of winning elections. Okay, so why is this? So the South African British descent were outnumbered by the Afrikaners and they had diverse interests based on occupation, occupation, social class and religion. So as the 1907 Transvaal election had shown, mining magnates like George Farrar and Percy Fitz, Fitzpatrick 
could not win the support of the British working class col col colonialists who had formed assertive trade unions and a Labour Party in the Transvaal. So a similar class division existed among the British in the Cape province and in the Natal. The one province, which was the one province with um, a British electoral majority. So the constitution favored the Afrikaner voters. Wota and Smart, meanwhile, were losing control over much of the Afrikaner electorate, which resented um which which resented their policy um of reconciliation they really resented their policy of reconciliation so james berry monarch herzog um the the orange free state leader who had already crossed swords with smart face failure to give dutch equality with english in the transvaal schools joined Butter's cabinet in 1910. so in january 1914 he founded a new national party committed to protecting the cultural and economic interests of Afrikaners and separate, separating South Africa from the British Empire. <clears throat> um, so come to think of it, Herzog's support came mainly from lower class Afrikaners, um, marginal farmers who resented exploitation by rich landowners and people um, who had been dislodged from the land they um, had put hard work in to make ends meet um, in the towns. So Herzog did also have support of Afrikaner intellectuals too. So World War I sharpened this division. So when Britain declared war on Germany in August 1914, Wurter and his colleagues expected the fact that South Africa, like the other self-governing British dominions, was automatically involved in this war, since um, it was not a sovereign state. So Smart went on um, prolonged campaigns against the Germans in East Africa, serving as a member of the British Imperial War Cabinet in London, and um, contributing to the creation of the League of Nations Adversaries. While Britain was distracted by the war, there were Afrikaners who saw this as an opportunity to raise an armed rebellion um, and against independence, but this was um, crushed. So Smart's government was losing supporters. The Afrikaner nationalists thought the Smart, that Smart had concerned himself um, with imperialist interests. They were also losing support from the white um, working class. So we're going to be looking at the um, South African, the South African National, um, the South African Native National Congress, the SANNC. So before the ANC, there was the SANNC. So in 1910, the Africans were having conversations amongst themselves about forming an organization that they would regard as a parliament for Africans. So this period was character characterized by events leading up to the formation of the African National Congress in 1912, as well as the organization's, um, as well as the organization's early years. So under the leadership of um, Pixlika, Pixlika Isaka Seme, the South African Native National Congress was born in January um, 1912. So it's ANNC was so SA so excuse me so the SANNC was formed in 1912 renamed the African National Congress or ANC in 1923. So in the image, you can see the SANNC founding members. So in 1909, a group of black delegates from the four provinces attended the South African 
Native National Convention in Vaivuk, Bloemfontein, to propose ways of um, objecting to the draft, to the draft, um, the South African Act and the Union Constitution. The SANNC meeting conveyed by John Dube and Dr. Walter Khubisane decided to send a delegation to London to convince the British um, government not to accept the union in its um, present form. So the delegation led by former minister um, William Shaina failed um, in its aims. So on January 8th, 1912, several hundred members of South Africa's educated elite met at Bloemfontein to establish a national organization to protest racial discrimination and to appeal for equal treatment before the law. So this group, interestingly, was made up of businessmen, journalists, chieftains, ministers, teachers, clerks, building contractors and labor agents. So um, Dr. John Dube, Dr. Khubisane and Dr. Pixley received their training um, abroad and their conception of a political organization was actually influenced by the politics of the countries that, that they were trained, um, that they were trained, the, which was the British Parliament and the American Congress um, and the Parliament in Holland and the France Parliament. So they were also influenced by their education in the mission schools. So there was an area in the Eastern Cape called Lovedale, founded by the Glasgow Missionary Society. It was an educational center for Africans. So the missionaries placed emphasis um, on village, village education, whereby the African would be taught skills and crafts that would be useful to, um, to him in life and in, in life. So it, education, they argued, should also aim at character training and at spreading the Christian mess, me, message. So they also wanted to see cooperation between the church and the state in the education of Africans. So the students of Lovedale were trained in all the fields of building, carpentry, printing, and so on. Um, it was from these institutions that teachers came out and spread out to other provinces. So right from the establishment of a political organization, the idea was the idea of one society in South Africa. This had people thinking about a non-racial society in South Africa. Then now we, look, we need to look at the 1913 Native Land Act. So in 1913, people were dispossessed of their only means of earning um, a living, which was the land. The Native Land Act of 1913 forced millions of black South Africans um, from productive farming across the country. Their cattle, their homes, their crops, their position, positions were all taken from them. So around 7% of the land was then relegated to black people. Um, it spread along the eastern coastal areas from East London in the Eastern Cape upwards to the border with Mozambique. Um, and as you can see on this map, the dots of land in Limpopo and Northwest provinces. So the new Congress limited black access to land and prevented Africans from owning land for farming, um, except in the reserves. This was an act of disposition. So in this map, this is a map of the distribution of land according to the act. So prior to this act, most of these black farmers were tenants um, on white farms, plowing a portion of land given to them and giving up to, um, and giving up to 50% of the harvest to the landlord to pay for their tenancy. So now under the act, this prohibited them from hiring or buying land. The landlord-tenant relationship was now a criminal offense in South Africa, for which farmers could be fined um, 
pounds, I think, um, which was a considerable amount, amount in those days. So the black tenants would then be given a stock portion, um, become the farmer's paid servants, or leave the farm. So something fascinating that happened after this act um, that came into effect was, the, was that so Blackie, who was one of the co-founders of the African National Congress in 1912, um, he spent several months traveling around on a bicycle, hearing and collecting stories um, from these newly, from these people who were newly evicted off their land. So so Blackie recounts a case where um, a young couple with a sick baby were forced off their land. So they hitched up on a wagon and after two nights on the road, their baby died. And having no land to bury the child, the only place where they, they were legitimate, I guess, to bury the child was al alongside the road. Um, they didn't have a choice. They couldn't bury the child anywhere else. So um, Blackie also tells us another story where a widow with her two teenage children and a toddler, when the law was passed, um, she was hopeful as a widow, you know, that she would be allowed to stay. She hoped that the landlord would um, propose reasonable terms for her, but instead his propo proposal was that she should dispose of her stock and indenture her children to him. So the widow, M Maria, could not comply with these demands, so she was told to leave um, her land. Her thatched, her thatched cottage was set alight with her clothes, um, with her clothes on her head, a three-year-old on her back, and the family left the farm. Driving, she drove her cows um, before her. The children were weeping bitterly. So there were exceptions um, to the rule. Blackie found on his travels that some white farmers were astonished, you know, with the cruelty um, of this new law. Um, these farmers continued to accept um, black, blacks as tenants on their land um, in defiance of this law. But it was really tough, guys, because um, even when these farmers would become defiant of this law and they would let their, um, not their, they would let black people live on their land, like they would pay a price for this. It's either the next white neighbor would um, snitch on them. Yeah, but there'd be a price to pay for this. So there was resistance to the new law. Women in the Orange Free State, um, and now the Free State, marched um, on the mayor's offices in Bloemfontein, the capital renamed, cannot say this, but I'll try, Makong, Makong, okay? Um, their pleas were rejected and they were thrown into prison um, in deplorable conditions. So Blackie went to England in 1914 to protest the law. He went again in 1919. So he went in 1914 and he went again in 1919 to protest this law. So after World War II, but never succeeded in having it abolished or changed in any way. Um, so their appeal to the English crown um, was literally just brushed aside. The crown brushed them aside. So there's a novelist called Bessie Head. She wrote in 1918, the 1913 act created a floating landless proletariat whose labor could be manipulated at will and ensured that ownership of the land had finally passed into the hands of the ruling white race. On it rest the past laws, the migratory labor system, influx control, and a thousand other evils that affect the lives of black people in South Africa today. So guys, as you can imagine, the state had the control of African peasantry. The black population was reduced to a proletarian um, status. So the act was passed to alleviate the problem of poor white farm laborers 
who were competing for employment on farms with black laborers. So the Native Land Act was also a measure designed to protect whites, not only the rich white farmers um, who were assured of the lion's share of available land, but the landless urban poor whites who could no longer be forced to compete with skilled or semi-skilled natives. So the act went beyond just dispossession, guys, um, just dispossessing people of, of the land. Um, it closed avenues of livelihood for Africans other than um, to work for white farmers and in industrialists, okay? So by the 1920s, some of the land was already carrying such a heavy concentration of people and livestock that the original vegetation was disappearing, streams um, and water holes were drying up and, the, and there was soil erosion um, that was spreading. So in the years that followed, African reserves, they just continued to deteriorate. So the state network of railways and roads served the white farmers, but neglected the reserves. The reserves were neglected and the government provided massive assistance for white farmers, but scarcely any to Africans. So the apartheid government implemented various policies that favored white farmers. This included providing financial support and incentives such as purchasing things like tractors for white farmers, the purchasing of things like tractors would then further marginalize Africans and just widen inequalities as Africans did not have such equipment on farms. Um, they were still using tools, hand tools. So after 1910, the people in the reserves became unable to produce enough food to what? To feed themselves. Um, so you're gonna, you can imagine you have the, the, so there's the soil erosion, the land is deteriorating, there's too many people packed in the reserves, you're unable to produce your own food. And then there's also, um, they also made them pay taxes. So taxes were imposed by the municipal, provincial and central governments which after 1925 included a poll tax of one pound paid by all African men aged 18 years or more, and a local tax of 10 shillings per dwelling in a reserve. So African farming gradually, it collapsed under those conditions, it collapsed. So now, those who had been prosperous in producing a substantial surplus for the market, they were wiped out. So the quality of life declined for all Africans in the reserves. Um, over one fifth of the children um, died within their first year of life because of um, undernutrition. Undernutrition was um, was was quite common. But now I'm quickly gonna go ahead. Something I remembered while um just something I remembered from your from from your guys is there's a Steve Biko um lecture record recording that you guys are gonna lis listen to or watch listen to rather um in the 1970s. So I just remembered something I mentioned in the, in that in a lecture that's still coming, that was, that was, that was let me slow down, that was um, mentioned by Prof. Leslie. Um, you know, I just said that kids were dying like flies during that period, like one fifth of children died within the first year of life during that period. So there's a story where um, the reserves, you know, they were in such poor conditions that moms, well, the, the um, moms would boil water, you know, children were crying because they were hungry. They were constantly crying because they were hungry. And moms would boil water. Um, they tell their children, their little children that, okay, food is coming, food is coming. And these children would just pass out um, while waiting for this food that is coming when it was just boiling water in those black, what do you call the black, um, what, what are the pots? The pochi, forgotten the course name now, for the pochi course pots. Um, so the, there were children just dying of starvation in large numbers in the reserves. Um, 
just to give you an idea of what is really going on. So, as I said, under, under nutrition was a com under nutrition was common. So the government left African education to missionary societies whose resources were very limited. And although it contributed more after 1912 to 1939, fewer than 30% of African children were receiving any schooling at all to equip them to adapt um, to the new order. So the reserves were being transformed into reserves of cheap, unskilled, um, unskilled labor for white farmers and industrialists. So almost, almost every African man with a home in the reserve went out to work on a white farm um, or in a, in a white town at some stage um, in his life. So the wages he earned those small, they became an essential part of um, the economy of his rural household. Um, so I have a picture here, the last slide, it's just a picture. So black people were living um, in separate homelands. Um, it divided the country into white owned and African owned land. The Native Land Act contained clauses designed to reduce all Africans into white-owned rural areas, into tenants and wage laborers. So white farmers paid um, the African workers low wages than they, could, um, than they could earn in the mining or manufacturing industries. The relocation, so the, the relocation of black South Africans to townships in the rural Bantustans was one of the defining and most brutal aspects of um, apartheid. So, um, I'll end this lecture here. Um, in part two of our lecture, we'll be looking um, deeply into black adaptation and resistance. Thank you for listening.